I forgot to set this up. Excuse me just for a moment. Apologize about that. There we go. Good morning, everyone. Very good to see you this morning. We have a good number of guest visitors with us, and we are grateful that you have come our way. I want to thank Zach for leading the, the songs. He said he was a little concerned about that last one and starting off on that high C, and he did just great on that. But, uh, and it helps, us, it helps the bases get it, too, if we can get it up there high enough. But just very, very appreciative of that this morning. And again, I want to thank uh, the gentleman that uh, spoke on, while I was gone, Pete, for taking the class last Sunday, uh, Dennis Ross, who preached in the evening, and Tim, who preached in the morning. And uh, we are very blessed to have a good number of men that are able to step in and to do a good job in our classes and our sermons, and very, very grateful uh, for that. I ran into this quotation the other day, and I wanted to share this with you by way of introduction. We're going to be looking at 2 Timothy 2.15 in just a moment. And the reading that we had a moment ago, I want to highlight that. But I saw this, and it is so apropos to what I want to talk about today. But hard work spotlights the character of people. Some turn up their sleeves. Some turn up their noses. Some don't turn up at all. <laughs> and I know that you might be thinking about that, and maybe you're thinking about your own particular job place. That how there are those various kinds of attitudes that exist. Uh, sometimes we look at the word work and might just almost conclude that it's another four-letter word. Because a lot of people try to avoid it as much as they possibly can. But as I was thinking about this in preparation for this, so much of the character that is the work ethic that we have not just in life, though that is important, and we're going to even make applications of that. It could be to the job place and other venues or scenarios in our life. But I'm just talking about a spiritual work ethic that we're to have. And this is what the Apostle Paul is addressing in many, many respects. And so when we consider this, and I want us to look at this idea of our very best to make every effort... It is a word that we have defined numerous times before. Now, when you look at 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 15, and there may be a whole lot of you that, like myself, even from a youngster, many of us learned this verse and learned to quote this verse based upon the Old King James Version of the Bible. And what does it say in 2 Timothy 2, 15, the Old King James? Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that need not be ashamed, but one that rightly handles and divides the word of truth. Now, what I want to share with you is very briefly is that the Greek word that we have that is found there, it's found 11 times in this particular form, 11 times in the New Testament, a good handful of times by the Apostle Paul himself, and it's spudazzo. Spudazzo, and it comes from a spude family, and in fact, in the lexical form of spude, which is itself found 12 other times, different verses. And it is the idea to do something with haste, to do something with earnestness, and to diligence. And when we look at this form of spudazzo, even as Barclay brings out a Newman and the lexicon, do one's best, spare no effort to work hard. And all of the lexicons, of course, weigh in as you would look at this, the idea to exert oneself, to endeavor, to give diligence. Now, many of the translations have decided, instead of using the word study, which really is far too narrow of a word. You'll never find it ever translated, this word spadazzo translated in study, as study in any of the other texts, because it just wouldn't fit. It wouldn't make sense. And it really doesn't fit the best here. That study is really one kind of idea about it. And so when you look at this, and when Paul is given this warning, and he has already, he has already shown that there were some false teachers, some saying that the resurrection was already past, and of course, as he writes this letter to Timothy, who is Timothy? Timothy is a preacher. He's an evangelist. He's preaching in the city of Ephesus. He's going to have to deal with some of these things, and there's no doubt. So when you look at verse 14 and 15 again, there Paul says to Timothy, remind them of these things and charge them before God not to quarrel about words, which does no good, but only ruins the hearers. 
Do your best, the ESV says, do your best to present yourself to God as one approved, a worker who has no need to be ashamed, rightly handling the word of truth. I've preached on this passage so many times, we've broken it down to three or four main points right out of verse 15 itself. But when you look at this word spadazzo, the idea of exerting oneself, but to do your best or to make every effort. Now there's no doubt that he has to deal with the word of God because he says at the end of verse 15, rightly dividing the word of truth. And, and we've looked at, at, at that whole concept of rightly dividing the word of truth. That is cutting it straight. It's that orthotomeo thing. It is that it is to handle with accuracy. It is to handle with precision God's word. But as we think about this, this word, the charge that is being given to Christians is that when we approach our faith and when we approach our responsibility as Christians in everything that we do, every part of our lives, as Christians, we need to do our best to make every effort. And I look at this, and according to the various translations that, that we have, the whole idea, though, it is something that is very qualitative. It has this qualitative aspect to it by means of endeavoring to do, to be the very best. To be the very best. To achieve this task the very best that you can. And that's why Paul will use it many times. James will use it. Peter uses it a couple of times in his epistles. But the idea is, Spadazzo, do your best, the very best that you can. Now, as I look at the audience and see a variety of ages here, and you have to think back of marketing and advertising, and there's two. There's two, two things with this, and one's going to involve Zach here in just a moment. But if you think back, how many of you can remember the motto for Knudsen, Knudsen Dairy Products? Do you remember what was even written on much of their, much of, uh, of their merchandise? The very best. Exactly. The very best. That was their motto. The idea of the very best. Well, when we're trying to pick out some songs that we're going to do, and of course, this song that we did at 395, to, to do the very best I can, did you notice that the line was in there? But I just asked Zach if he was familiar with Nestles. Nestles. And you remember the jingle that was given? N-E-S-T-L-E-S. Nestle's makes the very best. <laughs> Chocolate, okay, you got it. And so Zach sends me back this thing fairly immediately about this little picture and a little old, old ad with, with that thing. And I thought, I am amazed because of his age and he knew that. And then he sent back a second text and he said it was confession time. He had to ask his parents about it. <laughs> and so as I tell these kids all the time, you don't need to know, go to college. You just need to buy a smartphone. <laughs> now, why would any company do that? The very best. The very best. They're trying to portray something that is something that is, again, it's a qualitative thing. It's a quality. And there we will see that in Scripture that it is used over and over again that we have a responsibility to do our very best, to make every effort. But it also seems to indicate promptness as well. And even in some translation, and some, I understand that some of the paraphrases We'll say the new the when we look at a passage, remember, turn over here just right there, Second Timothy 2. Go to chapter 4. And in 2 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 9, remember now Paul is in prison. He knows that death is imminent. He has already said that earlier on, that he was being poured out as a drink offering. Verse 6, the time of his departure was at hand. He knew that death was around the corner and he was going to be martyred. But now he's making an appeal to Timothy. Because there are some things that Paul wants. He would love to have his coat or cloak and to come before winter. We're going to see that in a moment. But he really wants parchment. He wants to be able to write more letters. But you'll notice what it says in verse 9. There it says in verse number 9, Do your best to come to me soon. Notice the clock is ticking. And so we see not only a matter of, of do you make every effort to do this, but there's a promptness that is involved in this. Do you see that? Something that's very timely. That's why when you, and by the way, there's spadazzo right there. So then when you drop on down then to the end of the chapter, as he's beginning to close this, look at verse 21. And in these, some of these final words, he says in verse 21, do your best to come before winter. And uh, Eubola sends greetings to you and so forth. But do your best to come before winter. You know, the winter is coming. The weather is changing. But do your best. 
Uh, chronologists and some historians believe that Paul was either martyred at the very end of 6070, uh, 67 AD, no later than the spring of 68 AD. A chronology, some history seems to indicate that. But what I want us to see is that there is a promptness here as well. Even the new translation and what is referred to uh, as the new literal translation, hurry so that you can get here before we're winter. Because the translators look at that is that there is not only a matter of making every effort, but do so with in a timely fashion. But mostly what I want us to see in this is this qualitative aspect. Best effort. I'm going to ask you right now. When it comes to being a Christian, and no matter what part of our lives we're talking about, in worshiping God, in serving God, as we're going to look at a family aspect, and being husbands and wives and parents and children, and being brethren in Christ, and being neighbors and friends to people, that when it comes to these responsibilities that we have as Christians, what kind of effort does the Lord, the Lord want us to make? The very best effort we can. Obviously. That's why you will see this word used so many times. Do your best. Make every effort. It has so much to do with our best effort. What are we presenting before God? And when I think about this, our greatest example of this is God himself. That God has always wanted his people to offer the very best because he gave the very best. And that's a principle that we see. You know, even in the Old Testament. Under the old law and the Old Testament. And we know that they had gifts to give. Sacrifices to make. They had responsibility. I think of Exodus chapter 12 and verse number 5. And there when it was talking about the lamb and the sacrifice for the Passover that was to be given. In Exodus 12, 5 it says, Your lamb shall be without blemish. A male of the first year. You'll make, you will take it from the sheep and from, and from the goats. But the idea was, not only was there an age required and a gender requirement of this, but it was to be without blemish, without spot. They were to take and offer their seconds, to offer something that was maimed or diseased, but to offer the very best. Don't we see that repeatedly within Scripture? We really do. Even as we come to the end of the Old Testament, and through the prophet Malachi, in Malachi chapter 1 and verse 8, and there Malachi the prophet had to rebuke the children of Israel because of their failure to, to really tithe and give sacrifices as they should. And he says, and when you offer, this is Malachi 1.8, and when you offer the blind as a sacrifice, is it not evil? And when you offer the lame and sick, is it not evil? Offer it then to your governor. Now that's interesting. You know what? Here's what you're offering to the Lord. If you think that that's going to be acceptable, then when you give your offerings and pay your taxes, and they may do this more of a harder way, go ahead and give your lame animals to the governor and see how well that flies. And yet you would do this to the Lord? He goes on to say, would he be pleased with you? Would he accept you favorably? This is what the Lord of hosts says. We look at this, and no wonder the apostle Peter when we come to the New Testament, we'll show what God did, that God gave the very best. And because of us, and I appreciate of what was stated this morning at the Lord's table, that what was said, we know that the very best was given, that the blood of Jesus Christ, listen to 1 uh, Peter, 1 Peter, if you will, chapter 1, verse 18, please. And he says, he reminds these Christians, knowing that you were not redeemed, that is, your salvation was not purchased, with corruptible things like silver or gold from your aimless conduct, receive a tradition of your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. God gave the very best. Now, here is the Lord instructing us through his apostles, through these New Testament writers. And what is our responsibility? That we need to, as much as we possibly can, to offer our very best. To make every effort in every aspect, again, of our lives as Christians. Every part of it. As we're going to look at these applications that I have made in our, for our consideration this morning. It is necessary, it is incumbent upon each and every one of us individually. As you sit there, as I stand, even, even deliver this myself. But all of us need to very personally ask ourselves that when it comes to serving God and worshiping God, serving one another, when it comes to my responsibility as a Christian, 
And every day, and I tell you, this isn't just a Sunday, a Sunday only thing. This isn't something that we just occasionally, casually do. That we need to ask of ourselves and be honest about it. Am I giving? Am I offering? Am I doing my very best? Am I making every effort to do so? That's what Scripture really challenges us to do. So when you think about this, and there's a lot of directions that we could go with this, but I'd say we need to be our very best. We need to be our very best. And I wanted to make the application here that even when it comes to being in our homes, to be the very best, be our very best in our homes. We often make the point that a society is only as strong as the marriages and the families that comprise it. And I think that's so true. That you take a country or society, and if it kind of characteristically has weak marriages, troubled families, you'll find that that society is weak in many cases. But as much as that's true with society, and when we bring that in more locally, I would submit to you that a congregation of God's people is only as strong as the marriages and the families that comprise it. That if we have families that are weak, if we have marriages that are weak and families that are struggling and people that are not doing it God's way according to his word, I want to tell you that's going to be a troubled congregation. And so it is here that we need to be our very best. We look at passages like Ephesians 5, even into chapter 6, because it talks about husbands and wives and parents and children. The Apostle Paul does the same thing he did in Ephesians 5 and 6, but condenses it a little bit as he writes to the Colossians. And we look over Colossians chapter 3, and listen to what it says. And we'll start at verse 17, because this is a kind of, if really very similar to a very best concept in verse 17. How often do we quote or refer to Colossians 3.17? And whatever you do, in word or deed, what is that? Everything we say or everything we do. And whatever you do, in word and deed, do all in the name, that is the authority of the Lord Jesus Christ, giving thanks to God the Father through Him. Whatever you do, in word or deed, but notice the immediate application that He makes. Verse 18. Wives, submit to your own husbands as fitting to the Lord. Husbands, Love your wives and do not be bitter toward them. Children, obey your parents in all things, for this is well pleasing to the Lord. Fathers, do not provoke your children, lest they become discouraged. I'll even go on to talk about the, the master-slave relationship. I'm going to make another application later concerning that. But as I look at this, and I'm not going to preach a sermon this morning of, of dealing with all the roles of husbands and wives and parents and children. That's another lesson that would need to be very concentrated. But here's the question I want to ask you. That as we understand what roles God has given us as, as spouses, husbands and wives, as parents, as children, and especially as I address a lot of children that are old enough to understand what I'm saying, what it means to obey your parents, what it means to honor your mother and father, and certainly to the husbands and wives, do we not need to be, to be our very best in our family? Because I'll tell you, in so many respects, the future of this congregation, as I preach to the Los Soso congregation, is going to be so much dependent, again, upon how strong our families are in this congregation. We've got to look at that. We've got to see. Now, that doesn't mean that one has to be married and a husband and wife and children in, in order to meet. We have people that are not married, and we have singles, and we have widows and widowers. The whole point is, though, is that when we find ourselves in the family situation, that we have a responsibility of being the very best family member possible for our own good, spiritually, individually, but for the congregation. Brethren, we need strong families, we need strong marriages, and God's Word is what helps to determine what that is and exactly what that means. Be our very best. But then if you notice, I have another sub-point that I make in this point. And even when we're alone, even when alone, and now you can take that in two ways. Now you can take it from the standpoint, even if we are not married or we're not living with other family members, and yet we still need to be our very best. We need to be our very best in all of our conduct, in our morals, our ethics, our attitude, because I'll tell you this, every member of the congregation Male and female, young and old, 
every member of this congregation. And you may not be married and you may not even be connected right now to a physical family. You may be living by yourself. But I'll tell you what, you are a part of a spiritual family, aren't you? And there becomes those responsibilities as well. But then there's another way, not only alone from that standpoint, but I'm talking about in opportunities or situations where we find ourselves alone. It may be off on a business trip. It may be because a wife or some spouse is gone for a few days. It may be whatever. That when we find ourselves alone, when I thought about that, do you remember the problem that hit David? And this was a problem in 2 Samuel chapter 11. Look what happened before he commits adultery with Bathsheba. It was the spring of the year. This is in 2 Samuel chapter 11, verse 1. The spring of the year, the time when kings go out to battle. And David sent Joab and his servants with him. So all of the armies of David, they have gone out to battle, but David is behind. But look at verse 2. It happened late one afternoon when David arose from his couch and he was walking on the roof of the king's house that he saw from the roof a woman bathing. And the woman was very beautiful. And David sent and inquired about the woman. And one said, Is not this Bathsheba? the daughter of Eliam, the wife of Uriah the Hittite. So David sent messengers and took her, and she came to him, and he lay with her. Now she had been purifying herself for her uncleanness. Then she returned to her house, verse 5, and the woman conceived, and she sent and told David, I am pregnant. I don't wish to be insensitive in this at all. But I'll tell you what, we need to see the situation that David did not use the spiritual safeguards that as he found himself alone in that situation, and when he saw what he saw, when he viewed what he viewed, that instead of his mind, his mind being right with God, and instead of being his very best and turning away from that, and turning his mind away from that, no. We see what happened in all of the problems that it brought David from that day forward. You know, when we're alone, we need to be our very best. So I don't care if, if, it's, if it's with people or without people that we need to be our very best. I don't know how many times that when our children were growing up and we'd be going someplace and Vicki and I would tell our children and we're going to be visiting somebody or going to somebody's home. And you all done this too, most of you have done it. And what do you so many times tell your children? To be what? To your best behavior. Now really, we should expect best behavior all the time, shouldn't we? But then I thought about that. Doesn't God expect best behavior of us all of the time? And the, the fact of the matter is, because of God and who He is and what He can see and does see, we are never really alone, are we? B, our very best. We need to have that strong moral base. Then I thought about some applications when we use this terminology to give our very best, and there's so many applications of this as well, that to give our very best, and this is certainly true in our service to God. And again, we would think about what God expected, what the Lord expected of the children of Israel. And you remember in this very well-known passage, beautiful wording, by the way, in Micah chapter 6. Turn over there in the Old Testament, if you would. And the question is posed by the prophet, to the Lord in Micah chapter 6 and verse 6. And here's the question With what shall I come before the Lord and bow myself before the high God? Shall I come before him with burnt offerings, with calves a year old? Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams, ten thousand rivers of oil? Shall I give my firstborn for my transgression, the fruit of my, of my body, for the sin of my soul? You know, what question that the prophet is asking is very legitimate. I think that he was one that understood the love of God and how God had blessed him and the people so many ways. And the people were really, they were ungrateful. But so he poses this and he wants the children of Israel to understand this. When you look at this, what is it you think that we should give? What is it we should come before the presence of the Lord? What do you think he wants? Lord, what should we give you? Shall we just give all of these herds and flocks? Shall we give you just these, 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 these uh, barrels and barrels of, of, of all oil as offerings? Is this what you're after? And a lot of times people think, well, because maybe what they can give physically, materialistically, or financially. And that as long as they do that, maybe even do that well, that is to a certain amount, that that really kind of covers the basis. But I'll tell you, when you look at the teaching, verse 8 
He has shown you, O man, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you but to do justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. I'm going to tell you, that's giving your very best. Did they have animal sacrifices that they were supposed to offer back then? Yes. And were they to offer the best that they could? Absolutely. But can you imagine going ahead and offering the very best calf that you had, the very best lamb that you had, but yet you showed no mercy, no justice, you showed no forgiveness, no kindness, that you were one that, that did not show humility, perhaps were even arrogant because of the so-called good works that you did. And I tell you, there the prophet is letting them know you're not understanding what it really means to give the very best. When we bring that into New Testament language, and, and I think of Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. And Paul said in Romans 12, beginning in verse 1, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies as what? As a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And do not be conformed to this world. Don't just go the way that the world goes. But be transformed. By the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. I think the question is, and if we're going to give ourselves as living sacrifices. And that means that we're going to give our lives from this standpoint. And not necessarily dying, although Revelation 2.10, that we must be willing to be faithful even to the point of death. If it would call for it. But as we live, should we not be living sacrifices by putting the Lord first and giving Him the very best that we can. And here's the question that I really thought about. Why would we want to offer anything less? Why would we want to offer anything less? So if there is an application when it comes to a contribution, that's fine. The comment that was made before we took up the contribution uh, today. And we're doing it in this way to come in. And it's not a matter of having people come in and soliciting funds from people. We understand that what our obligation, our responsibility is. But not only is the responsibility simply to put that contribution in the plate. As commanded 1 Corinthians 16. We get that. But it's an attitude as well. And that in 2 Corinthians chapter 9 and verses 6 and 7. He says, he who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and he who sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. So let each one give as he purposes in his heart, not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loves what? A cheerful giver. And most of you know, even what the Greek word there is, hilaros. Well, we get our word hilarious. Now, not mindless frivolity. But that which produces or brings about great happiness and satisfaction. That when we do our very best, when, when we're making every effort to give our very best. And again, it's an attitude. It's a priority. It's a qualitative thing. Cheerful is an attitude that produces the best we can do with gladness. Not just the spirit of duty, but with gladness. Give our very best. I wanted to make this application as well, even on our job. And it's here that when Paul in Ephesians chapter 6 and Colossians chapter 3, when he addresses, again, this responsibility that slaves or bondservants had to their masters, listen to this carefully in Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 5. Bondservants, be obedient to those who are your masters according to the flesh with fear and trembling. And sincerity of heart as to Christ, not with eye service as men pleasers, but as bond servants of Christ, doing the will of God from the heart, with good will doing service as to the Lord and not to men, knowing that whatever good anyone does, he will receive the same from the Lord, whether he's a slave or free. Now I realize that there was this very slave, master slave relationship, and that's not seen really in our society today, unless you feel like you're a slave to your job, and maybe you do. But I do think that there is an application here because we have, we have jobs. We have responsibilities. And here is the point. When you look at any group of workers, no matter what kind of job, what kind of work it is, and it can be out in the field somewhere, it can be in an office, you may own a business, you have, may have several people that work for you or you work for someone. I tell you that as you look at the workforce, who really should be the most dedicated, diligent, honest, best workers. 
Christians. Should set the tone, set the example. That we see that because this is really giving glory to God. Christians should be the best laborers. They should be the best workers. Christians must give their very best. It's an attitude. We need to be our very best. We need to give our very best. And may I suggest to you, we need to show or display our very best. Now again, in showing, I don't mean showing this. Not trying to talk about highlighting something where we come walking in and people say, ooh, look at him or her. No, no, no. In the showing of the displaying here is what and how we present ourselves, even as we do in the community. Again, it may be the job place. It may be at school. It may be in the neighborhood. There are a lot of venues, places of which we need to let our light shine as Christians. And are we showing our very best so that people will know that individual is a Christian? That individual is a person that follows the teachings of the Bible. When Jesus gave those two dynamics in Matthew 5, what we call the similitudes, that we are to be the salt of the earth and the light of the world. In other words, our discipleship and following Jesus should look like this, is what Jesus is saying. And he talks about the value of salt. In Matthew 5, 13, you are the salt of the earth, but if the salt loses its flavor, how shall it be seasoned? It is then good for nothing but to be that to be thrown out and trampled under foot by men. Salt was used for two purposes, even in days of antiquity. It was used certainly as a flavor to enhance food, but it was also used as a preservative. But inasmuch as it was influenced to enhance the flavor of food, so we need to show and enhance righteousness in our lives before others. We need to be the salt of the earth, and we need to preserve, as they took salt and would coat fish or meat and allowed it to be preserved for periods of time. Are we not to preserve righteousness in the wicked world in which we live? We are the salt of the earth, and the second dynamic is light. Verse 14, you are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hidden. Nor do they light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a lampstand. And it gives light to all who are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. That's a responsibility. Let your light shine. It's an influence again. It's an example. But recognize to what purpose. Not for self-glorification, but that your Father in heaven may be glorified. This is the responsibility that we have. I want to ask, when you think about this, this is this not a marvelous approach, at least one wonderful approach to evangelism? That if we want people to see who Jesus is and what Christianity is, that what biblical Christianity is, do not people out in the world again, job, school, you name the place, do they not need to see that in our lives personally as being the salt of the earth and the light of the world? Do we see that? So do what? Show our very best. And it's going to be applicable to all people, to brethren and to those outside of Christ, to the unchristian. It is here that uh, I have as a reference 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. And in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 verse 9, when Paul writes to the church in Thessalonica, he says, Now concerning brotherly love, you have no need that I should write to you. For you yourselves are taught by God to love one another. And indeed, you do so toward all the brethren who are Macedonian. Now, they understood that, and that's something that they should be doing, and evidently they were doing. And he would continue to encourage that in what our influence is on our brethren and loving one another. But notice verse 10. At the end of verse 10, but we urge you, brethren, that you increase more and more, that you also aspire to live a, to lead a quiet life, to mind your own business, to work with your own hands as we commanded you, that you may walk properly toward those who are outside. Now, what does he mean by those who are outside? He's not talking about people outside of a church building. People outside of what? Outside of Christ. That are that are not Christians. Towards those who are outside, that you may lack nothing. Here's the question I want you to think about. What is your reputation, first of all, in the congregation and even among the brethren that know you? Are you known as one who gives and offers and shows or displays your very best? What is your reputation? 
among the congregation. And then what is your reputation in the community? Even people outside of Christ. Again, job, school, neighborhood. You pick the area. What is your reputation? Are we displaying our very best? And when we come up to various scenarios in life, and it could be on the job place, it could be in so many different situations, and all of a sudden, because something is said or something is done, how do we show ourselves? How do we display ourselves? And we need to show our very best because whose name is it that we wear? The name of Christ. We are Christians. And in as much as my daddy always said, and he'd say to my brother and I, that you remember who you are, and, 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 and some of you know, and we've got a couple of visitors here that were here back in the day when my dad was the law in Moral Bay. And, and they said, well, you know, and he'd say, you protect that name, the family name, the willing name. And that's all good and important. But we wear the name of Christ. And there's a name that we need to protect. What is our reputation? When people look at us and they come in contact with us, even in difficult circumstances, what is our reputation? Are we showing our very best? It's fidelity. Make every effort. Does that make sense? We go to our final point then. As we think about that, we need to serve our very best. Serve our very best. All of us need to have servants' hearts. We really do. I preach on Ephesians 4.16, and not just as a singular text, but I put it into sermons like probably only about 50 times every year. Ephesians 4.16. And as he has shown God's wise design of what the church is in verses 11 and 12, until we come to this unity of faith that is with the full disclosure of God's revelation, the Word of God, because this is our standard of authority today, ladies and gentlemen. This is our standard of authority today. It's the Word of God. And the Word of God shows us what God wants us to be doing. But when you look at Ephesians 4.16, here's what Paul says to the church at Ephesus. He says, from whom this whole body, speaking about the church, from whom the whole body joined and knit together by what every joint supplies. We're like this body, joints, ligaments, this connectivity, if you will. Look at it. What every joint supplies according to the effective working by which every part does its share causes growth of the body for the edifying of itself in love. How many times do we see in Scripture, Romans 12, 1 Corinthians 12, Ephesians 4, over and over, that there the Apostle Paul likens the church, the body of Christ, as a body having a head who is Jesus Christ and all of these other body parts working together in unison, in a coordinated fashion. If you are a member, if you are a Christian, if you are a truly a disciple of Jesus Christ, and you are a member of His body, that means you are a body part. And do we need not do we not need to work together in harmony and unison? Every part doing its share. It comes down to this pragmatically: that being able to just go down, and I mean, just say, I mean, Zach has a part, and, and we look at this. Bryce has a part, and Amy has a part, and Lydia has a part. We'll pick on the visitors. But you know what? You have a part in your body too. The thing is, every part does its share. And this is serving our very best, remembering that we serve the Lord Jesus. This is our responsibility. Every part doing its share. Now there is an involvement here. And how many of you were here? I was not because I was gone on a meeting. But who was here last Sunday morning? Who was here last Sunday morning? Tim preached a sermon dealing with what principle? One another, one another, one another. I, I went online and I, I listened to the sermon. Great job, I might add. And Tim went through and looked at that reciprocal pronoun, one another, and multiple times it's found. I'm gonna tell you right now, we're in a one another religion. No man is a spiritual island. We're in a one another religion. And there's so many things that we do, and we are to serve, not only as we say, I serve the Lord Jesus Christ, but we are to serve the Lord Jesus Christ together, but we are to serve one another. Remember what Jesus said to his disciples early on? Mark chapter 10, verse 43. Mark 10, verse 43. Because he knew that his apostles, as he was giving him a tremendous responsibility, a lot of authority, by the way, 
to be an apostle of Jesus Christ, these emissaries of Christ. But they had to have the right mindset. And in Mark 10, 43, yet it shall not be so among you. Whoever desires to be great among you <clears throat> shall be your servant. And whoever of you desires to be first shall be a slave of all. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. The apostles were not to go out and to act as though people were going to serve them. The people were going to just honor them. The people are going to bow down to them. That somehow they're going to be given special privilege. I'll tell you what. The true servants of God who are even put in leadership roles will never have that type of an attitude. That if we serve, and as, and as, as Hoyt and Tim and myself, as we serve as bishops or as elders of this congregation, there it is. We are to serve as elders. We are to serve. We are to serve you. But we are to serve one another. And Jesus wants the apostles to know that you are servants. And who's the greatest example of it? Jesus himself. For the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve. His life was one of servitude. This is the attitude that we must all have. In Galatians 5.13, Paul writing to the churches in the province of Galatia. And he says to those brethren scattered about in Galatia, Galatians 5.13, For you, brethren, have been called to liberty. Only do not use liberty as an opportunity for the flesh, even though they have some freedoms. Don't be selfish. He says, but through love, serve one another. I I'll tell you, it would be a wonderful, wonderful situation. Male or female, young or old, new Christian, older Christian. But if we could just get this. How about, and not in the spirit of competition, but in the spirit of making every effort to doing your best, doing that, if we would just have that attitude that we're going to outserve each other. Let's outserve each other. That is trying to give our very best. We must seek to serve others and not seek to be served by others. Well, I'm glad you know about N-E-S-T-L-E-S, -E -E Zach. And we can understand why corporations and businesses may use those kinds of models because they think they have some product or something that's the very best. But what we are to do as members of the body of Christ is we are to offer to give our very best. We may fall short from time to time, and we're going to fall short from time to time. And we're not talking about being people that are without sin or without flaw. No, we all have sins and we all have flaws and attitudes. But it should be our desire to offer our very best as children of God. And quit making excuses for doing otherwise. You see, God more than deserves our best efforts. Because God gave his very best when he gave his son. And it is son Jesus Christ that is calling people to come and be a follower of him. To be able to come to him and know that if you obey his gospel, you can become a Christian. And he laid down his life that we might have life eternal. And that we might have an abundant life. Are you ready to confess your faith based upon your repentance of past sins? Are you ready to have your sins washed away, to be baptized into Christ for the remission of your sins? And then just think, you'll come up out of that water at that moment, the very, very best shape you've ever been since you were born. And then make it a reverend, our endeavor, to continue to do the best we can. If we can help you with any spiritual need at this time, we give to you that invitation. It's together we stand and sing the song that has been selected. Oh, through Jesus, Jesus.